Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to all of you. Welcome to this first Utopia High Level Debate on the Future of Europe. My name is Luc van Langenhoven and I'm the academic lead of Utopia at the VUB Free University of Brussels. And it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's event. First, let me say something about Utopia. Utopia is an alliance of six European universities that aim to create together a cross-European inter-university campus, as we call it. On top of it, we want to use the momentum created by our deep collaborations to transform our six universities, transform them in such a way that they can better respond to the challenges of today's world. As a reminder, the six universities we are talking about is University of Ljubljana, CY in Paris, Pompeo Fabre in Barcelona, Göteborg University in Sweden, Warwick University in the UK, and my home university, PUB in Brussels. I would very much like to take this occasion as an opportunity to thank explicitly the rectors of the six universities. I know some of them are listening. I thank the rectors for their immense support to this process, which is at the end of the day, quite an adventure. What do we want to do with Utopia? Well, basically, Utopia is driven by its ambition to do better. We want better education. Education that ensures not only the employability of students in today's world, but also contributes to the formation of responsible, well-informed citizens. We want better research. Research that not only serves the growth of the national innovation system, but also serves the global commons. We want better connection also to our local environments in order to feed in and stimulate the local ecosystem of knowledge. And finally, we want another better mix of, on the one hand, excellence, with on the other hand, inclusion and cohesion. So these are quite formidable ambitions. And it, we try to realize that at the European level. And that raises questions. That raises questions such as, what can we expect from working at European level? Can Europe help us in realizing our ambitions as six national universities? And of course, also the reverse question, can we help Europe? Because we don't have straightforward answers to these questions, we thought it would be good to organize a series of events to discuss all of this and see what we can learn from those debates. And today, I'm glad that we can start with the first of a series of six events. The first one organized by the VUB together with the College of Europe. And its focus is upon the future of Europe and its implications for European higher education. So what we have on the agenda is first of all, two introductions by our guest that I will introduce in a moment, followed by a debate where the questions will be introduced by several students and that will be moderated. And the moderator will then end the evening with closing remarks. So that's the agenda. So having said all this as an introduction, it is my honor to welcome our two distinguished guests. First of all, Rector Frederica Mogherini, who is Rector of the College of Europe in Bruges and in Natalin and also former High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. And in that capacity, she was also Vice President of the European Commission. Welcome, uh, Rector Mogherini. Next, we have uh, my colleague, Professor Jonathan Holzlag, who is Professor of International Politics at VUB, and uh, well known for his uh, writings, and especially for his uh, advisory role, on, amongst others, to the Vice President of the European Commission. Welcome to you, Jonathan, as well. And then we have Professor Luc Souter, who will be uh, the moderator of the debate. Luc is now the Dean of the Brussels School of Governance at VUB, former rector of the Maastricht University. And so, uh, Luc, welcome to you as well. And finally, I have to also to greet the students of Utopia, the Brussels School of Governance and the College of Europe. And they will be introduced uh, properly by Luc later on in the debate. So, a final word to the audience. Welcome to you too, of course. And uh, I would like to invite everybody who's listening to us to use the chat room and voice your comments and your questions uh, as we go on. And there will, it, it's kind of question and answer system where you can also like and vote for the questions or the, the comments that some people will put on the uh, screen. You will see how it, it works. So welcome to all of you. Let's immediately jump into the topic of today. And I'm very uh, happy to give the floor to Dr. Federici Mogherini for her initial statements. 
Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for uh, um, having proposed uh, to myself personally and to the College of Europe to work together on this uh, uh, event, this launch, uh, this initial event of uh, this series uh, we are inaugurating tonight. Uh, I'm very proud of that, uh, I'm very honored and humbled, uh, and uh, uh, this is a special thanks uh, uh, to you personally, Luke, but also to all other colleagues and friends. Uh, I, uh, as, as soon as I arrived in, uh, uh, in Bruges at the college uh, as a rector, I realized how important it is to connect uh, with universities, and knowing that the college is not a university as such, uh, we are um, uh, a higher education uh, institution that focuses on master uh, one year only, but uh, and e European studies obviously, uh, but it is so important to liaise and, and connect with universities, starting from my perspective with the Belgian ones, but obviously also with the network of universities that are focusing uh, on European Union, European studies, and obviously this proposal to, to work uh, with Utopia on the future of Europe is, is definitely something that fits very well and perfectly well, I would say. Uh, on the mission of the College of Europe. Um, I will try to share with you a few um, reflections that are personal reflections on what I believe the role of higher education can be in shaping the future of Europe. Uh, and uh, if you allow me, I would start doing so from, uh, from a personal perspective, sharing with you a, a private view on that. Um, and this is probably uh, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm currently director of the College of Europe. Many people were surprised when I moved from being uh, in the European institutions uh, to uh, leading uh, a higher education institution without having myself an academic background. I, never, I was never hiding this. Um, but there was a specific reason why, uh, why I was um, doing that move. And that is because working inside the European institutions uh, and also in national institutions before uh, in, in Italy as, as a minister of foreign affairs or the Italian parliament before, I've noticed that uh, the uh, quality of the uh, policies and the institutional work, in particular at the European Union level, is determined by, uh, I would say, the ambition and uh, the critical capacities uh, of the officials that work in these institutions. And so if we want to have high quality European policies, we need to have uh, critically uh, able uh, students that then uh, have the aspiration of joining either uh, the, the policy making or the institutional work at the European level. And so my, my personal motivation, my personal reflection was, okay, I've, I've worked so far on the institutional level of the shaping of the European Union, in particular on the foreign and security policy, but I would like to, to move one step backwards and, and focus on which are the building blocks that then enable decision makers uh, to take the right decisions in terms of policy. And I always was very frustrated when I heard, and I still hear from time to time, uh, people referring to the younger generation as uh, the future. I believe that the younger generations, and in particular university students, uh, are uh, actually holding many of the keys to open the doors or to find the solutions to the present problems. Uh, if they are enabled to do it, if they are empowered to do so, if uh, we manage to open patterns that allow them to give an input uh, into uh, the problem solving or the policy shaping uh, of, in particular, of the European Union. And so I think that in the moment when the European institutions start the process of reflection on the future of Europe, uh, this is a perfect time for university students, and I obviously include in that also uh, the College of Europe students, uh, into giving a contribution to that debate publicly with their hard work studying, uh, and also, uh, I would say, not only preparing for the future job, but also developing already now uh, the ideas that can then contribute to the, to the policy um, decision-making process uh, at European level. Um, in order to do that, I believe that we as, as higher education institutions, we have a responsibility uh, not only to transfer knowledge, but also uh, to empower people. Uh, you uh, put it, look, in terms of, uh, um, uh, of uh, developing citizens' uh, approaches. I think this is essential. I would add to that uh, developing a critical uh, capacity of analysis and, uh, um, and elaboration. Uh, that I think is essential in today's time. And um, 
I think that this debate we're having today would be completely different uh, if it was held uh, one year and a half ago. And probably we would have discussed of a much more traditional patterns of, of contribution of uh, higher education to the European Union future. I think that today, after more than one year of, of pandemic and all the policies related to that, being it the economic uh, um, uh, um, package, being it the, the health uh, um, one, uh, being it the geopolitics around uh, vaccines and uh, equipment, I think that today, or the digitalization, I mean, one year and a half ago, we would have held this conversation in presence in Brussels, most likely. Um, we live today in a world that is completely different than one year and a half ago. And in this particular moment, I find it particularly essential and crucial that higher education systems empower young people to give their own view on how the current present and the, current, and the coming future can be shaped, because they know better than us. That is the reality of fact, I believe, on some issues, not on everything. Uh, I'll, I'll point out to three main elements that I believe can really be crucial in terms of life experiences in higher education um, uh, institutions at this stage to help shaping the future of Europe. And shaping the future of Europe, empowering the students to contribute to that. This is for me the key. Uh, the first one is um, what, I, um, what I see every day uh, experiencing in, uh, in, uh, in Bruges, in Natalin, uh, but I, I know that this is uh, happening in all uh, your universities as well uh, and uh, um, in, in the School of Governance. And this is diversity, living diversity, living together. I think that this is the real laboratory of how we can contribute to shaping a, a better future for the European Union. Uh, the experience of uh, uh, the intercultural learning, the experience of respect, the experience of uh, um, learning by doing uh, and experiencing, sometimes having also very difficult moments far away from home and, and having to interact in a complicated environment as you are studying, writing your thesis, passing your exams, so on top of everything else, is in itself, I think, the best training to build European citizenship, which is at the end of the day what we need, I believe, to shape, um, to shape uh, um, uh, a better Europe, a future better Europe. The second element is, I think, uh, specific to this last year. Uh, I think that we have all uh, experienced a, a, a huge shift uh, from in-presence to digital uh, and uh, uh, with some frustration from students from time to time. Uh, that's normal also from professors and from ourselves. But I think that this is what I always tell to uh, our students. I think that having lived the experience of going digital, hybrid, in presence, digital again, hybrid again, uh, on a very short notice and on very rapid cycles. First of all, has been a good uh, crisis management training, even for someone that has been doing crisis management all her life like myself. Uh, but uh, I think that this is something that actually our students should put in their CVs, because this is exactly the kind of skills that you would need in the world of tomorrow when you will work in institutions or in the private sector or uh, in academia. This capacity to adapt, this capacity to mix the digital and the real world uh, is something that we have acquired, um, uh, making uh, out of uh, necessity a virtue, uh, but uh, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's, a, a fundamental, uh, it's a fundamental key uh, skill. And uh, I really believe that this is something that sometimes we underestimate, uh, but I really think that this is uh, um, absolutely uh, crucial. Um, and then uh, the last uh, element that I would like to, to underline, uh, in order not to take too much time, um, I, I mentioned that already a little bit, is, is this uh, key uh, power that I think higher education systems can have of uh, trying to motivate, encourage, and empower, I would say, the capacity to dare, uh, the capacity to think out of the box, the capacity to uh, be yourself even in an environment that is not necessarily encouraging you to do so, uh, and to, um, to try and avoid homologating yourself too much with the system you have around. And I think that's the key element of higher education systems is exactly this, the capacity to develop critical approaches and I would say an identity that is strong enough uh, to be respectful and open to others and at the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, aware of what your added value is with your own diversity that you're bringing in the 
experiences. This mix of openness, respect, uh, multilateral, multicultural and cultural approaches, together with the awareness of who you are and what your value is, I think is the best contribution and probably the most important contribution we can bring to the future of Europe. I say so because um, I've experienced so many times in the European institutions this, uh, this pain, if you can, uh, if I can put it this way, this sorrow, to see brilliant, uh, great uh, young officials, enthusiastic, with great ideas, feeling as if they were in the duty of uh, using the same words of their uh, senior colleagues, uh, using the, the, the same formula, repeating briefings that have been repeated hundreds of times, and the added value of all of that is zero. So I think that the, the, the academic institutions can not only transfer the knowledge of how it works today, but also transfer the ambition to bring in your, your personal sparkle and, and, and try to lit some lights. Then it might work or not, but daring to put your personal contribution into the system I think is the added value that that you can uh, that you can bring. And here, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm already addressing the students because uh, at the end of the day, that is what passionates me the most. So uh, I'll stop it here, uh, and I don't want to uh, to take too much of uh, of the time. And look forward to uh, hearing uh, Jonathan and also uh, obviously the students' questions and comments. And really, very much looking forward to the debate. Thanks again uh, for uh, setting this up and uh, inviting me and the College of Europe to join. Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, very inspiring words, actually. So, Jonathan, I'm sure you have something to say about these things, and the floor is yours now, so go ahead. Thank you, uh, Luke, and let me also to, uh, to repeat um, that this is a fascinating and uh, I think even overdue initiative uh, to join forces between European universities and uh, and I wish you the best of luck um, with uh, this project. And, and I hope, of course, that in all modesty, I can uh, continue to contribute uh, to it. I would subscribe to most of the um, suggestions that Mrs. Uh, Mo uh, Mogherini made, especially the need for breaking through the group thing that uh, often tends to be uh, become quite prominent, if not nagging in a lot of the uh, in international and European institutions. Now, I would like to really focus also on, um, on education, uh, higher education, and I also want to be honest with you, because as a professor, and I think uh, Luke, uh, Luke knows that, um, I have had a lot of doubts over the last, uh, last years, and, and I've been through uh, a lot of reflection about what my role could be as, um, as a professor in this very um, university education uh, uh, system. And um, what I have become very concerned about is this growing gap between, on the one hand, the ideals that our universities put forward, such as leadership, inclusiveness, um, uh, democracy also, and on the other hand, the extent to which they can be fulfilled in our classrooms. I think there is a growing gap uh, between, uh, between the norms and the ideals on the one hand, and on the other hand, the organization and means that we have at disposal to make it to make it happen. Uh, and this really becomes a struggle, I think, for a lot of students, also for a lot of, uh, a lot of teachers. I'm also quite concerned by um, uh, the gap between, um, and, and, and Mrs. Mogherini also referred to that, on the one hand, the growing demands and challenges that the world confronts us with, challenges that as such can become opportunities for us to show leadership, but then again, on the other hand, the extent to which we prepare uh, our students um, with the wisdom, the discipline, the courage, the empathy um, to, uh, to meet them. So as a, as a professor, as a teacher, um, I must say it's not always easy. Uh, COVID in the last year has uh, made uh, things a bit more complex, but I think fundamentally um, our European um, university education is confronted with, uh, with quite a lot of um, a lot of challenges. Yet still, I also believe that uh, Plato was right when he stressed that um, the main tasks for the guardians of our society is in education and that it's really in the classroom that we um, start to erect, to pull up uh, our defenses and our resilience as a society, as a political project, even as a as a, a civilization, and that this is indeed also the, the breeding ground, if not the cradle of, um, of, of, of civicism and, and civic uh, engagement. So um, 
as much as it is important uh, uh, of trying to become a leader, it also remains very uh, important uh, to continue to instruct and inspire and coach those uh, future leaders. I think it's one of the most beautiful um, and, 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 and challenging uh, also um, in a way uh, responsibilities that you can uh, assume. So what should our European higher uh, education uh, look like? Particularly, I would say in the domain of um, humanities. Um, I think in that the primary responsibility is to enforce European citizenship. Without that kind of soft, mellow core of citizenship and, and dedication also to our societies, it's going to be very, very difficult towards the outside, the rest of the world, to keep upright, a solid diplomacy, uh, well-functioning European institutions, good trade policy, and so forth. I think what what really shapes the the, the resilience and the, the 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 power in many ways of political projects and societies is this dedication, this this attachment, also this this feeling of love. You can also say in a in a way uh, to what make to what makes us specific, what makes us unique. Um, and, and what is really the, 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 um, the, the, the sense of attachment, uh, I, I think, that we feel or should feel uh, between uh, all participants uh, in, um, in this project, in, um, in our social uh, adventure, so to, so to say. And I think in that regard that it's also very important that the next generation of le leaders overcomes a bit the kind of pragmatism um, that is characterizing uh, European politics today. I think what we really need um, is the kind of leadership that has the skill, the vision, and perhaps also the imagination to reconnect ideals um, and, and let's say the more pragmatic uh, pursuit of, of power. Oftentimes um, in um, periods of necessity and challenge, the fallback mode of uh, societies is to drop the ideals and to go for the preservation of power, to go for the real politic, to go for the economic opportunities and so forth. I believe that that for Europe would be a tragic mistake and that what the new stage of European power politics should be about is exactly this reconnecting of power with, um, with ideals, transcending and overcoming, I think, the kind of pragmatism that makes us lose uh, legitimacy on the inside, but also on the outside. I think for education, this is going to boil down to five cardinal balances, as I would call them. And the Chinese are very good in, in, in coining uh, things that, that way, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to borrow a bit from, from them. First important or cardinal balance is between um, the interest and the growing interest in so-called decolonization of the university curriculum and the preservation of um, uh, European identity, the preservation of, uh, of a sense of identity uh, in our education uh, system. I think especially in a world of advancing authoritarianism and state capitalism and, and ideas that are not necessarily the ideals that we hold uh, dear to us, it's crucial that we stop relativize some of these core values of democracy, human dignity, uh, and so forth. It's evident that others can have alternative views, but we cannot break the resolve to defend our own uh, core convictions, uh, at least not for ourselves. This doesn't mean that we should impose them elsewhere, that we should always go out in the world and, and lecture, but we should have the tenacity, I think, um, for ourselves um, as, uh, as one of the participants in world politics uh, to defend what we, uh, what we stand for. That doesn't mean, however, that we cannot pay attention to other cultures. I think while we um, try better to understand where our own uh, core values come from, at the same time, it's, it's crucial, it's vi vital and um, indispensable that we also pay more attention to other cultures, civilizations, their histories, their concerns, uh, their sensitivities, and so forth. So I would really aim at rebalancing between, on the one hand, the necessary um, uh, pledge for having some kind of democratization of the curriculum in terms of alternative cultural um, and so forth approaches, and on the other hand, also standing firm um, on some of the, uh, the core values um, of, um, of Europe. 
second balance is between ambition and humility. The conviction of young leaders should be nothing else than helping to shape the world and, and to, to try to harness this kind of restless energy of our society to create a better world. But I think what's also very important is that we understand how strong the forces of history and power politics and often sometimes also sheer ignorance of, um, of people can, can be. And, and that this passion of idealism should be somewhat um, uh, balanced with the wisdom of realism. Again, this doesn't mean that realism should um, uh, fade out um, and make disappear our values and ideals, but I think along the way, and that's a challenge for most of us, we, we should try to, uh, to find an equilibrium. A third balance is one between elitis, elitism and grassroots engagement. I think that for each hour we spend in uh, conference rooms uh, and, and, and in planes on the way to international events, we should also have the discipline to continue to be connected with the grassroots. And I think this really is one of the main problems of uh, diplomacy in, in general. I would also say for the European democracy uh, bureaucracy, that's, that's a, a quite significant gap uh, between the bubbles of policy making and the rest of society. And that is really, um, I think, um, a challenge, if not um, a danger um, to the legitimacy and the credibility of, um, of leadership. So trying to reconnect with, um, with people as broadly as possible and also to engage via social media and other channels in debates with non-experts and to try to um, get a bit of sense of, um, of other patterns of thinking, uh, other concerns is absolutely vital. And oftentimes you can pick up as much from a conversation in a pub and a bar than in a conference room with um, uh, highly um, uh, educated um, and experienced people. Fourth balance is between specialization and generalism. Uh, I think we ought to continue to see the big picture. Um, and I think um, technocrats often, uh, let's say strictly speaking, technocrats uh, often make bad leaders. Uh, I think it's important to remain and continue to be a generalist, but then also to have the skill to go into depth whenever necessary. And then finally, I think um, universities must strike a very good balance between democratization and merit meritocracy. Um, we have to create opportunities for talented students with backgrounds that are less evident, with limited resources, family situations that are not um, so, uh, so comfortable, yet we should not lower the threshold. Democratization doesn't mean that we give everybody a degree. Democratization means that we provide um, the due opportunities to talented people, but that we continue to put the bar um, very high. And this also comes with the responsibility, I believe, of, of tailor-made um, coaching. I think leadership ultimately is, is about mental and intellectual top um, athleticism. Uh, it's about top sports, um, nothing less than that. Um, and that gives the university the, the, the duty, I, I believe, to have this fine-grained personal um, um, uh, contact with, with students to try to also assess where the specific uh, talents are uh, and to make them um, uh, develop even, even further. That I think also is a matter of clear priorities inside universities. We cannot do everything um, at, uh, at the same time and we should be realistic. If we aim at leadership, if we aim at uh, excellence, it comes um, at the cost of certain choices and we must also not shy away of these uh, these choices. I think that is becoming uh, a very important um, pressing, but also a very difficult uh, challenging, uh, a challenge and task um, that many of our schools and universities are confronted um, uh, with uh, today. Voila. These would be my uh, five um, proposals in all modesty that I would like to uh, put forward for, uh, for the discussion. And I look very uh, much forward to the interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. And thank you also, Mrs. Mogherini. As we do have some time, because I, I think, Mrs. Mogherini, you were pretty 
limited in your intervention, I would first ask you to maybe respond directly to Jonathan on his five cardinal balances, and particularly the first one, because I think your experience of the past has really dealt with this in terms of how you stick to your values in this international context, etc. And I, I would love to hear how you would respond on that specific point. Possibly there might be others, but I would give you a couple of minutes just to react to Jonathan first before opening the discussion. Wonderful, and thank you, Luke, for uh, recognizing my efforts and uh, uh, deconstructing the stereotype of an Italian woman speaking too long. So uh, I was, I was, uh, I was just focusing on trying to be short to start with because I have the tendency, I have to warn you, uh, to be longer in the replies to, to the questions. So I, I have to manage my time carefully. Um, I, I found uh, uh, this this five. Uh, um, uh, Ten elements, actually, uh, this five dichotomy is very interesting, and in particular, the first one, indeed, uh, look, uh, uh, sounds very familiar to me. In particular, uh, when we were working uh, in uh, uh, when I was uh, a high representative on the global strategy of the European Union, some of you might have heard of that or even read it. Um, if you're studying uh, European studies or international relations. Uh, this was one of the key elements of uh, debate uh, in academia, in think tanks, uh, in uh, uh, member states, in uh, European Parliament, in the Commission, in European institutions at large. Um, do we go for uh, our values of our interests uh, as if it were a dichotomy or a dilemma? My personal approach, and this is also reflected in the global strategy that is still valid for the European Union, um, even in a very changing, rapidly changing world, uh, is that actually, um, and I'm very much convinced of that, uh, the dilemma is a false one, because there is no way, but I understand this is my personal um, strongly value-based approach, uh, there is no way, I believe, in which we can really um, achieve our objectives on our interests, our long-term interests, if we do not invest in our values worldwide. Again, it's not about uh, preaching and teaching uh, because this balance of re being respectful of uh, other viewpoints, other experiences, other in the way in which other societies historically work. But this, um, I mean, we are in, in Europe, the, the, the place where uh, indeed the universality of rights uh, has always been uh, uh, rooted. And I think we have to be proud of that. There are some basic values, some fundamental rights um, that are universal uh, and then can be defined in different ways. And I was just discussing yesterday with a student that is preparing a thesis on, uh, uh, on uh, democracy promotion in the Middle East. And, and I was telling her, you know, this, this false dilemma, uh, that at a certain moment we faced in the European institutions, and, and it's recurrent also in the academic debate, uh, do you prefer to invest in stability or in democracy promotion in some countries? It's a false dilemma, it's a false question. Why? Because if you don't have a democratic space, if you don't have a space for uh, civil society participation, human rights, rule of law, functioning democratic institutions, in the long run, even in the short run, I believe, but for sure in the long run, there's no way you can do counterterrorism, proper security, management of migration flows, and you name it. So the only way, this is the European experience at the end of the day, the only way to have a strong society is to have a sustainable security somehow that mixes uh, the short-term interests with the fundamental values. So for me, uh, the balance there is, is quite easy to find. It's more difficult to tell, and here comes, I think, also the role of academia. Because I was reflecting on this, there is a, what I've experienced is, is, is this, the European Union has, is actually still currently the uh, European, the, the, the global uh, player that is investing in democracy promotion and in the promotion of values the most in the world, after four years of Trump even more so. But the narrative in Europe has changed as if we were uh, even uh, ashamed of promoting democracy and values around the world because our public opinions have shifted. And now ask how you're spending the budget, either national or European level, according to the short-term priorities of, that are perceived as pressing for the European public opinions. And so I have the impression that we have kept the focus on democracy and values promotion in practice, hiding that behind a narrative of interests promotion. 
Uh, I understand that this can be useful for building consensus and buy-in from the public opinions. You use what you have. But on the other side, I'm worried because this could in the long term or in the medium term actually even deteriorate our public opinion support to those same values and, 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 uh, uh, and fundamental principles that are the DNA of the European uh, identity. Um, I'm, I'm worried for that. This, this leads to a political debate more than an, an academic one. Uh, but I have the impression that sometimes in Europe we are, uh, we are almost uh, uh, shying away from our own values, while we actually uh, are the first promoters of them in the world. And I see a dangerous contradiction there. And I think academia can have a fundamental role in trying to rediscover the reasons why our values actually serve our interests. I'll stop it here. I will not comment all the others because otherwise we'll finish this way. <laughs> No, but I think this is fine. This is great because I, I like to have a little bit of first sort of uh, interaction between the two of you. And we now open basically the discussion for the students. We have about one hour uh, and I would ask and I would invite uh, students really to uh, put forward their question to do this in a brief manner. But I will first ask therefore Christophe, if you could just introduce yourself and then ask a question. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Christoph Latka. I'm a student at the Brussels School of Governance, uh, second year studying international affairs as, as my major. The two questions I'm posing are definitely more applicable to the political spectrum of my degree. Uh, and therefore, uh, question number one um, integrally touches upon the topics that have also been addressed by all uh, the excellent keynote speakers. I'm talking about what the impact is of multilateralism um, in higher education, and then extending that question to what extent can higher education foster nonpartisan politics? Thank you. Who would like to start first? Uh, Jonathan? Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Luke, and thanks a lot, Christoph, for this uh, very challenging uh, set of questions. Starting with uh, the second uh, uh, part of your intervention, uh, um, education contributing to nonpartisanism. Um, I think one of the, the, the vital um, tasks of education is to um, challenge and, and, and encourage people to um, continue to approach things with an open mind. I think one of the main dangers um, at school and also university education is that um, young people um, slide into an early closing of the mind, with which I mean that at a very early stage, they cling to certain philosophies, ideologies, um, or political uh, entities without preserving that readiness and curiosity also in a way uh, to try to understand, assess um, uh, alternative viewpoints. Um, and I think that's also um, partially even the result um, of how we teach. Um, I think the way we teach, um, and I think I mentioned it also in a, in a, in a Belgian television show over the weekend, the, the way we teach is a kind of teaching in which we sort of pre-organize and categorize a lot of things. Um, which I think in a way also um, um, uh, leads a lot of students to conclude that everything should be compartmented and, and, and categorized. I think what's a very important um, responsibility of universities is that we continue to encourage and help young people to wonder um, and, and, and to move from the one ideology to the other and, 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 and to try also to work towards a personal synthesis. And I think it is this skill that is going to be vital um, for citizens in general, but certainly also for young leaders to try to overcome the many political divisions that are often not so very productive, um, that sometimes paralyze European societies. But again, the bigger the scale of your universities and the more you have these big, big uh, student groups in large auditoria, the more difficult it gets um, to, to, to nurture and, and cultivate this, this, this critical thinking, this, this wondering 
um, uh, how, how, how um, more challenging I think it also gets to pay attention um, to um, to nuances that we we all have um, in um, in our in our reflections on multilateralism and higher education. Well, multilateralism is in our European DNA. Uh, Mrs. Mogherini uh, spoke of European security strategy. You cannot read a single European foreign policy document without a reference to multilateralism. But of course, our position in international institutions depends very much on the capacity to lead by example. Uh, whether we talk about climate change, whether we talk about uh, racial equality, gender equality, all those things, the only way to really weigh on multilateral discussions is by setting good examples. And I think, therefore, what we ought to have is a, is a two-track policy in which, on the one hand, we, we strengthen um, the, the, the position of our society as a, as a role model, and on the other hand, also then using that internal strength uh, to enhance our diplomatic bargaining power uh, in multilateral institutions, which also, I think, shows instantly that you cannot have the external without the internal. You cannot have a lot of external leverage um, if um, the internal situation is becoming so disorderly that um, your partners and your competitors start to ask uh, questions and, and, and dispute some of the legitimacy. Thanks, thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, Mrs. Mogherini, I think the College yes. d'Europe is a multilateral institution. Absolutely. Uh, I, I would have said that. I mean, uh, for what concerns the College of Europe, for sure, we are leaving multi multilateralism. And uh, this is what I refer to with the value of diversity. I think this is the best contribution we can give as higher education institutions to multilateralism, which is that of making it uh, part of the life of our students already when they are in our institutions. Uh, so that then it becomes practice uh, and, uh, and something alive. But it's also, uh, as, as was mentioned before, uh, the, the, the contribution that higher education institutions can give to, to good multilateralism uh, and functioning multilateralism is also um, good investments in, uh, uh, in diplomatic uh, uh, skills. And uh, because diplomacy can be put at the service of many different things. Uh, and so uh, as you work on the values, you also have to work, I think, and this is where we come in, on providing the skills and the empowerment tools to those that will put them at the service of, uh, in this case, multilateralism. Um, and if I can react in a provocative manner to your uh, second question, uh, I'm, and that might be an issue of language, uh, but, are we sure that nonpartisan politics is something we have to look for? Because I remember very well that uh, some 10, 15 years ago, uh, we were discussing about the problem of the um, there is no alternative, uh, which is uh, uh, something that was dating back actually of the 80s and the 90s, where Absolutely. the world seemed flat, the political world seemed flat. And there seem to be only technical solutions and not political debates. Now we are living in a completely opposite situation where everything gets polarized. Uh, but I, I, I think there is a value in, uh, in having some uh, element of um, contradictory uh, politics, mm -hmm. preserving the nonpartisan policies. That, yes. But I think that the distinction between a policy and a pol politics uh, is, is essentially, and personally, I'm very excited when I see young people, uh, not only the generation of university students, but also the younger generation, uh, so passionate and motivated. It's true. There is a risk that this leads to closing your, your ears and eyes and mind to other options. But this also comes with age. Um, the, 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 the age of university studies is normally traditionally the age of strong passions and the conviction of being right, no matter what. And that's OK. <laughs> Uh, if you don't have that conviction at 20, 25 years old, uh, uh, that, then probably you will have it at 50 and that's worse. And, and here comes indeed, I think, the value of, of, um, of also provoking passionate political reactions and even affiliations, why not? But at the same time, building a strong rationality on the policy nonpartisanship and also an open mind and, and uh, a critical approach to your own conviction uh, don't need to go back to the Greek philosophers to, to, to say that the core element here is challenging your convictions all the time. 
questioning them every day and every hour and every half an hour if you can. And this is the, the, the nature of, of academia at the end of the day. Well, thanks, thanks very much for these reactions. Christoph, satisfied with these reactions at this stage? I guess so. We then we move on to we, we get marks. Give us marks. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'll come back to that on the marks. Yes. Adam, you were the second one in line for asking questions. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, great pleasure to, to be here. And I'm also happy to discuss the, uh, such an important thing like education uh, with, with you today. Um, so uh, yeah, my name is Adam. I study at uh, VUB at the Euromaster. I wanted to ask you about um, the future of higher education in Europe. So we see there is lots of uh, different uh, initiatives in, in higher education, in education, uh, which are uh, developed by the European institutions. Uh, and uh, also we see that the pandemic or digitalization, they also require universal uh, solutions across the entire continent. Um, this is why I wanted to ask you if you think there is a need or space uh, for um, equipping the EU with more responsibility for education, maybe conferring shared competence uh, in that field. So we're, I appreciate a lot your answers. Thank you. So who would like to kick off? From shall, this? I, shall I start first this yeah, time? We are too late. Yes, good idea. Please. Um, I have to say, um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking loud. Um, my general approach in this particular period of time, but this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, not related only to education, uh, is, is, is related to the future of Europe reflection, uh, is to, um, to, to proceed a little bit cautiously uh, with uh, revisions of competencies uh, in the European Union context at this stage. Uh, now, this can be very controversial. And if you ask anybody in the European Parliament, almost everybody in the European Parliament will tell you that it's time for treaty changes. Personally, having lived the institutions from within and uh, seeing the political dynamics across Europe, I fear that if we open uh, the, uh, the treaty changes right now, we might end up with worse treaties than we have today. So I would act carefully in that direction. Uh, but it's true that the pandemic has, uh, I think, brought a different kind of dynamic uh, to, um, to the European Union Institutional uh, Division of Labour and Competencies Allocation. And we are, see, we are seeing in this last uh, 12 months things that would have been completely unthinkable uh, even, uh, even two years ago uh, in terms of uh, uh, some taboos that have been broken uh, be because every crisis produces a reaction uh, that has an institutional impact and, and uh, political impact as well. So uh, on, it, on education as such, um, I, I don't know if uh, it's time for the European Union to have more uh, competences on that. Uh, I imagine that member states would have a strong resistance on that, mainly for curricula and, uh, uh, and uh, other issues. What I, what I would very pragmatically say, but this is uh, uh, a rector's uh, view now, is that the important thing is that the European institutions continue to fund uh, with European resources the education system in Europe. Uh, this is priority number one, I would say. Also to lead, by example, to indicate to national governments that this is a sector where you need investments. And I believe, by the way, that the pandemic indicates to us that uh, the need to invest in uh, research, not only on, on the health system, on, on the health side and, and sanitary measures, but on, on everything is, is a key element that empowers you to be safe and secure in the future. Uh, and, and then probably, I would say that experiences like this one we're having tonight and other forms of networks are probably the best way to go, uh, to go in that direction of developing a, a more and more European uh, way of uh, developing higher education. Um, again, I don't know if, if, if I'm, I'm ready to change my mind. I don't have strong feelings on that, but I would, I would probably go step by step and, and say the more we manage to uh, connect uh, universities and higher education systems in, in across Europe and in Europe, also maybe a little bit beyond Europe, uh, or at least a little bit beyond the European Union, because for instance, I think of the Balkans, why not? Uh, some, sometime or, or the Eastern European countries that are not part of the European Union yet. I mean, there is a space, I think, for European connections and policies that can go even beyond the European Union uh, institutions. So uh, I think that academia could be uh, even a little bit more creative uh, in, uh, in developing a European space. This is, by the way, what academia has always done since the very beginning of universities. 
uh, starting with Bologna um, centuries ago. And uh, uh, Europe has always been part of the DNA of, uh, of European academia. So uh, I think we can be somehow an avant-garde um, institutions, not sure, but the money is. So Jonathan, what do you think on, on the issue about European universities or European decision-making about universities? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Luke, and thank you, Adam, also for that uh, that fascinating question. I would uh, echo most of uh, Mrs. Mogherini's uh, suggestions that we should be a bit cautious. Um, there are um, some important ways with which uh, in which the European uh, Union already makes uh, makes a difference, and I think the main uh, responsibility in that regard right now is to make sure that with all the measures of economic relaunching after the outbreak of the COVID pandemic, we, we get our economy back on track. So that means um, a remain disposal to invest in education across the board. I think that's going to be the main um, um, uh, test for the European Union in, uh, in the months to come. Um, second, I think we should continue investing in mobility and connectivity. And I think in that regard, COVID has been a blessing. Uh, without any exaggeration, I've been participating in more European seminars and conferences last year, being digitally, of course, than, than ever before. Um, so I think we, we really discovered um, and, and be assured for this conservative, old-fashioned academic, it was, uh, it was somewhat of, a, of an issue at the beginning, but we, we, we discovered new uh, um, uh, means and, 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 and media through which we could interact rather, uh, rather easily and, and, and to network. Thirdly, and very importantly, is that the EU also has a role in preserving academic freedom. We have certain countries in which uh, some of our core values are being challenged, uh, also in the realm of, um, of education. Uh, and I think it's vitally important for the European Court of Justice, but also for other institutions that um, we really stand strong on, uh, on those things that, uh, that are at the core, I would say, of the European, uh, European project. If we allow those things to be defied um, by certain politicians, um, I, I, I think it, it will um, have big consequences for Europe in the, in the long run. And perhaps a final remark, which also harkens back to what Mrs. Mogherini answered to the previous question is, the strength of Europe and I think also its innate uh, capability to um, forever innovate itself and reinvent itself in its, is its uh, resides in its diversity. Uh, and I think what we ought to need is indeed um, uh, to have a certain creative friction um, uh, between cities, universities and so forth. We, we cannot afford, let's say, the academic landscape to become a bit like a, like a, a monotone uh, flat world. I think this, this kind of creative friction is, 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 is crucial and we cannot um, uh, transform European academic education into a monoculture that would be... Um, would be a bit the Chinese way, I would say, uh, and this is not the best way to tap into um, your creative potential. Thanks, thanks very much, Jonathan. I'm sure, Adam, we will come back on these issues because it's a central issue, of course, is the way higher education is organized and, and the various different ways in Europe, nationally, regionally, uh, and what do you roll in there is of Europe. I would like to move on to the next set of questions because we have lots of them. And so I would first now like to invite Sahil. Please, could you raise your question? Yeah, and present yeah. Yourself? thanks. Uh, my name is Sahil Kamboj, and I'm a PhD between uh, CY Sergi Paris University and the University of Warwick in the UK. And my question is the inclusion of different education systems to create a common European understanding would be challenging. And the European Universities Initiative is the first step towards this goal. What kind of other incentives do you think can be offered to the traditional systems of education to change for the future? And thank you for the answers in advance. So. So Jonathan, you go first now. <laughs> that was a very difficult question, I must, I, I, I must say. And it makes me think, first of all, uh, about the definition of traditional education. What is, what is traditional education? Uh, I, 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 I wonder. Um, 
I think that oftentimes, let's say the old fashioned education, um, just the habit of taking a good book and sp spending a while in, uh, in tranquility to read that book, to digest it and to reflect upon that. It's perhaps old fashioned, it's traditional, but it's not necessarily, um, it's not necessarily bad. Um, I think one of the crucial challenges, perhaps building on that, is going to be to teach um, young people to deal with this superabundance of signals, um, media, and, um, and, and information, and especially to find the, the, the discipline uh, in, a, in a way to continue to be focused. What, 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 what I really experienced throughout many co courses is how much difficulty students experience just to read uh, a simple article or to read a text and to, to stay focused on that. Uh, and perhaps that becomes an indispensable skill that amidst all the noise and the constant bombarding of facts and insights and opinions, we learn to be to be to be focused. That doesn't mean that we we, we shouldn't draw from from as many sources as possible, um, but that 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 there is this kind of self protection almost that we uh, that we that that we learn to develop. Uh, because otherwise, I think you you are in a constant situation of drowning in 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 in, in all that information, um, and and I think that could be one of the the the, the new tasks and responsibilities of European education, education as a whole. I really wouldn't use the word common European education or education system. Uh, as I said, I, I would go for the diversity and amidst that diversity have as much mobility as possible. I agree very much with, uh, with what you said. Uh, I have to say, um, I might have little experience uh, to answer your question properly and uh, with the right insight because the College of Europe has really nothing of traditional education, I would say. We count on our students to have had the solid traditional education before. And then actually the college main feature is the fact that we have uh, uh, almost as many visiting professors as students uh, and half of them are practitioners. And so the mix, the diversity in our case is not only on the student's body, but also on the faculty. Uh, it's what we call the flying faculty because they normally come in for two days and then fly away, uh, which has some limits of one, in one aspect. Again, you would not get the traditional approach that it's needed, but I trust universities to provide that. And even schools, if I, if I, can, if I can tell you, I think that uh, if you look at the non-higher education system, um, I'm, uh, uh, one element that worries me a little bit is that uh, the, the, the school system in Europe, I think, is in some countries in particular losing the capacity to teach our kids to focus, sit down and read and write basic things, uh, traditional things. But once you get to the master level, I think that uh, that is more the time for experimenting and, and mixing and testing. But indeed, there, there might be an element of traditional values in there. But to me, yes, the, the, the incentive to, to uh, at the end of the day for any higher education institute is at the end of the day, the response of the students. So I think the students have a lot of power in that respect. At the end of the day, uh, the demand um, it, it shapes the offer sometimes. Uh, and so I think that uh, the kind of interest that the students show in some programs or in some, um, in, in some is of, of the approaches that we have across different institutes uh, is at the end of the day what tells the institutions themselves which direction to go, even if I would be very careful here not to be completely driven by uh, demand, uh, because that might lead us in, uh, in a direction that is uh, opposite to the one we were discussing in the very beginning of this exchange, which is the core focus on the values, the principles, and what needs to be transferred and practiced uh, to develop uh, citizens, and not only uh, students that are able to enter the job market uh, the following day. Uh, so um, the, 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 market, the, the demand driven approach uh, should not be, I think, uh, the main element for uh, higher education institutions to shape their curricula, but uh, you also have quite some power in determining, in signaling what you like the most and what you ask the most, what is most relevant for you to learn at the end of the day. So it, I think it's that there's, there's a powerful input from students there to be 
to be looked at. Let me let me just add that I think that you could say that the history of the European higher education area, because that for exist as term and as a concept, is very much based on trying to harmonize certain technical aspects of education so that you get some kind of convergence. And I think in this sense, Sahil, this is the sort of educational inclusion. We have common numbers of ECTS points. We have agreed degrees, et cetera. And this is all has been part of the Bologna process, which is of course much broader than just the European Union uh, higher education systems. But I don't think, and I think this is both what Jonathan and Mrs. Mogherini pointed out, you shouldn't go too far in this. If you go further, you might well enter into say, well, we will use English in all these kinds of programs, or we will converge in other areas. I find it fascinating personally to see that the famous, uh, you know, as part of the Bologna process at some stage, the Dutch Minister of Higher Education introduced this notion of having common accreditation. And what occurred out of this is there was just one common accreditation organization which was set up, which is the NVAO, the Dutch Flemish Accreditation Organization. And what you could see over the years is that it fell apart. And now you will see that actually the Flemish government withdraws from the NVAO in the coming, I think, months or year. And so you see that this is again separated because even in accrediting programs, there is a difference, a cultural difference in assessing exactly how particular code will be filled in and how evaluations are being done. So you see, even at that level, there is diversity. And to translate that diversity in a common assessment, which would mean changing your curriculum, which would possibly even in extreme means stopping your particular program is something which on both sides of the, of the border were not accepted, even in a common language area such as Flanders and the Netherlands. So, but, so I think there are limits here to what, how far we can integrate the systems. We can integrate very much the students, the mobility of staff, the international classroom, all these notions, but the systems itself, I think, will remain diverse and be part of this diversity in higher education. But I'm, I promise myself I will not intervene here. I'm, doing, I'm concluding later on. So let me quickly move on to Paul, who had a question. And thanks very much, Sahil, for your question, of course. But let me move on to Paul's question, please. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. Um, I'm Paul Villaverde, a 19-year-old student from UPF Barcelona, who studies um, philosophy, politics, and economics. And more recently, just a month ago or so, the general coordinator of the Utopia Student Think Tank, which you may know is an initiative in order to give voice to the student community in our universities, right? And who knows, maybe someday to influence the European policymaking processes. Uh, and my question is related to that. It's in fact a sort of double question. Um, how can the student think tank contribute to shape the future of Europe? And whether if the upcoming conference on the future of Europe is a space for that? And then secondly, um, how can the connection between the EU institutions and the youth be strengthened? How can we be a, a bond between the institutions and the students at campus? Thank you. I'm happy to start uh, on this. Um, I, I, was, I was lucky in the alternate uh, thing because indeed this is a question uh, that, uh, um, that, uh, uh, that I think is extremely relevant, Paul. And uh, um, I believe that, as I said in the beginning, you should not only aspire to provide some inputs or trying to shape the policies in the future, but I think you have a responsibility to try and do it now. Uh, mirroring this responsibility you have, there is a responsibility of the institutions to open channels for you to do it. Uh, the, the two things go together. Um, I, I've, um, uh, I've, I've uh, actually started uh, being active uh, as a student representative or in the youth organizations when I was 16 and uh, never stopped. So uh, I, I, I'm very familiar with this uh, uh, long-standing debate about whether you ask for a space uh, or you, you, you fight for space. Uh, in any case, you must get a space uh, one way or another. And I think, uh, personally, I think institutions, in particular European institutions, have an interest at this stage uh, to open up spaces for um, youth organizations, student uh, bodies, networks uh, to get inputs. Uh, you, obviously, you can also go for the other um, 
for, for the institutionalized option. Um, nobody forbids um, a 19 years old uh, student uh, to participate actively uh, in, uh, in, in, in politics and policies. Uh, so you can also you, you can also go to the institutions. Don't don't think this is impossible because it is possible. Uh, don't don't think that this is only for for sixty years old uh, uh, people. No, it, it's I think our institutions need young people to get in uh, and and be the decision makers and and the leaders of today, not of tomorrow. I, I strongly believe in that. Uh, I've always believed in that, and I think that when we face diversity, it's not only diversity in terms of. Uh, background, religion, um, culture, gender, it's also an age diversity, a, a generational diversity that we need to have reflected in, in the institution. So that is for me one element that is important. I found it surreal when I, uh, when I uh, became high representative. Uh, most of the critics were about my, uh, me being too young, uh, and I was 41. And I was shocked. And I was the youngest uh, in, in the commission. Uh, I was the youngest among the commissioners and, and vice presidents. And, and I found it unhealthy. Uh, any institution uh, should have a diversity of, of generations represented in it, uh, including uh, the European one. So that is one channel. Then the other channel is obviously um, pro participating actively into the, uh, the channels of dialogue and, uh, uh, and exchanges that the European institutions set up. And I am 100% convinced that um, the, the process that is opening up on the future of Europe is uh, an excellent opportunity to do so. For students, for academia, for higher education, uh, we had uh, in Bruges, uh, um, virtually, so in Bruges relatively, uh, in January, a conference on the future of Europe that was uh, opened by uh, the European Parliament President Sassoli, planned to do it on a regular basis. Um, I understand that um, the, uh, the, the, the presidency of the conference is looking at uh, uh, dialogues and citizens' dialogues that involve the university and students uh, all across Europe. I think this is a good opportunity for us to contribute to that. And, and for me, this is the natural way to go. So my, uh, my um, invitation, my, my encouragement is to, to actively participate. Right? For that, obviously, you cannot have the guarantee that your ideas will be part of the final outcome. But nobody has, not even the prime ministers and the president. So uh, that is part of the difficult negotiations that come out of that. Uh, and then there's uh, also, uh, yes, the, the institutionalized channels of youth participation, in which I believe uh, a lot. Um, in in, in uh, at the European level, you have the European um, uh, Youth Forum and that gathers all the different European uh, youth organizations or national um, youth councils in which student representatives have a role to play. Um, you have the institutionalized channels in which you can have your voices heard. And I, I really think, you know, sometimes you consider this as, a, as an exercise. No, I think it's really this moment, in this moment, where there's no certainty and there's no paradigm you can apply to the world of today. So all solutions are new. I think in this particular moment, the contribution that your generation can bring is literally vital because the approach that is normally and traditionally there in institutions, we do as we always did because it worked, today doesn't apply anymore because the world is completely different. And so you need new solutions to new problems. And I think your generation is the one that can give them, uh, or at least try, then, then you might fail, but uh, also other generations have failed. Uh, so I, I, I really believe that this is, uh, this is a good opportunity. And I really believe that uh, um, uh, there will be channels for uh, young uh, people and students in particular to contribute to the conference uh, on all the different topics. And, and don't focus only on youth uh, topics or, or uh, education topics. Uh, uh, go on uh, security, energy, transport. Uh, uh, don't do the mistake that women did uh, at a certain moment of focusing on gender issues only. Uh, dare to say what you think about the health systems and the um, financial uh, measures and, and and everything, but I'm sure that you would do that because you're, because you're good students of good higher education institutions, so you're well prepared. Jonathan, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Luke. Uh, there isn't that much that I can add to uh, all the uh, channels that uh, Miss Mogherini. Uh, presented uh, to uh, to you. I think the conference is going to bid an experiment for all of us. Um, but perhaps a suggestion on a slightly different note. When 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 I was around, I think twenty five or so, I had with um, 
with a with a few friends, academics, and people in uh, in politics. This little uh, circle of ethics, aesthetics, and poetics we call ourselves. Um, but the idea was that we didn't only want to be a a, a, a think tank, but also a bit of a of a dream tank to uh, to to continue to engage ourselves to try to really imagine what uh, the society of the of the of the future uh, would be and i think we we, we do need that um, imagination i think it was shakespeare who once said have the heart to love and the courage to to show it and um, i think what we ought to have in academia a bit more is is we have to have the courage to dream and the skill to explain it and 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 and, and that i think could be could be a nice um, sense of mission for the think slash dream uh, dream tank. Um, if we depart just from the policy processes and the institutions as they are, I think um, from the beginning we close too many doors um, that um, could give us the freedom uh, and the creativity to get to views about the future um, that are perhaps not so conventional but can be as much persuasive and, 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 and interesting than a lot of the things that are on the table today. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Jonathan. Let's move on to, uh, to uh, debate further actually about inclusion now and very much in the educational systems and all the challenges which are there at national level, at European level. So Carmen, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Carmen Mazen. I'm a PhD student at uh, VUB and I work on the fairness of uh, artificial intelligence system. So for my question, um, in their intellectual pursuit, universities can be rather self-focused. However, the cities that they are based in are home to a diverse population, clearly not only students and professors. So how can universities and European universities such as Utopia engage with citizens who live around their campuses, observe their academic processes, but do not, due to a variety of reasons, take part in them. So again, Jonathan, you go first. Yeah, thank you, Carmen. Um, I saw Rav De Vos, um, one of our uh, VUB uh, directors, the HR director, already making the suggestion in the chat that it's kind of a Kind of challenging for for students and I think also for um, for their uh, uh, lecturers to um, on top of the curriculum already engage in all these extracurricular and and off campus uh, e events. Um, yet I still believe that it is important to be inclusive. That it's important to be inclusive um, on campus and to make sure that uh, our students uh, reflect a good mixture that we also have in our in our society, but that it's also important to get the campus deeper into uh, into into society. And um, what it requires, I think, is a little bit more time and scope um, um, for both students and lecturers to 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 engage in that. What what I try to challenge my students every year is to come up with a concise portfolio. Um, in which they report on some of the events um, online, of course, last year uh, that they attended off, off campus. Um, and, and, and we ought to prod um, our students from time to time to, uh, to explore this um, opulence and, and, and treasure almost of uh, opportunities that we have in cities such as Brussels. But I would say by the same token, most of other uh, European, um, European capitals. Uh, so it has to be a continued um, effort, but as Raf de Vos also suggested, it requires that there is scope, that there is time uh, and that there is some breathing space for all parties involved to um, to get to to make this happen. So yes, I am. Uh, I, I could probably answer from two points of view. Uh, mm -hmm. One, uh, the experience I've seen in this uh, this year in in Bruges, a very particular situation, a very interesting one, I believe. Uh, but also probably as a Brussels citizen uh, living in a university uh, area of the city. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I could be probably an outreach for, for, for yourself if you want to interact with the diversity of the city. Jokes apart, uh, in, in, I can share with you the experience we, uh, I've seen in, in, in Bruges in this, uh, in this even difficult months of, uh, uh, of pandemic where uh, we have actually experienced this strange mix 
uh, very unique of having 350 students coming from all over the world, literally, in residences inside the city center during a lockdown period, a uh, very prolonged one, following courses online with a city around them with restaurants and bars and sometimes shops closed. <laughs> Uh, and uh, a very strange dynamic, uh, and sometimes with also some tensions. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised this has not come up yet, but uh, I don't think it's a taboo. I think university students, uh, higher education students in this difficult lockdown period have experienced probably the toughest conditions of all um, for different reasons, uh, but, but mainly because you feel that you have been somehow. Um, uh, deprived uh, from living fully, uh, one unique experience that uh, uh, you have now and, and you don't have in 10 years. And so living a lockdown when you're 50 or 40 and living it when you are um, 20 or 25 is a different thing. And this has had a reflection on the interaction between the student body and the city around us. This has happened in Brussels, I see it. This happens in Bruges, this happens everywhere in Europe and the world, I believe. Uh, having said that, uh, in very practical terms, um, what I see in Bruges uh, is something I love, which is that the fact that we have students living in residences in the city center, uh, in seven different residences, so it's relatively small residence. We don't have a unique a one campus, big campus isolated from the city. So we, we have students living in buildings in the city center, so we, neighbors sometimes creates problems with the police at night, that is right, but also on the other side, um, encourages our students to do community activities. Uh, for instance, uh, they do a lot this year, they've done a lot of charity, they've done a lot of uh, voluntary work. Um, somebody that, I don't know, plays a piano or uh, any instrument uh, performing in, in uh, um, uh, healthcare uh, uh, um, institutes or um, uh, um, donating blood and uh, uh, collecting uh, food for families in difficulty. They're doing a lot of charity. Normally, normal times, they do, um, they, they also do in the Bruges community, that is a very particular one, also um, family meetings. So the neighbors invite the students for dinner or for lunch on Sundays. They do activities together over the weekend. Uh, but this is something that is probably easier in a smaller city uh, that has. Uh, um, our students as one of the main uh, younger generations uh, citizens, uh, because it's also quite an elderly uh, populated uh, city, at least in the city center. So, but, but I see a lot of positive dynamics, experiments that, uh, uh, that uh, are happening, and many of them are out of the initiative of uh, our student societies uh, that organize the national weeks, uh, sometimes inviting uh, the, the citizens to join, uh, we're also now experimenting, uh, hosting some art exhibitions in the premises of the college, so to open up the spaces and integrate uh, the, the college as much as we can with the city. I think that there are some small elements that, again, easier in a small city that, rather than in a big city, uh, but uh, that can be promoted also by the, uh, by the administration of the universities and the, the higher education institutes to, to encourage students to interact with their communities. As much as possible. Thank you. I think I it's part of the experience. Thank you. I think we will continue actually on this, this point very much with the next question. Thanks very much, Carmen, for the question. And I'll give over now the floor to Fernando. Um, hello. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your interventions. And my name is Fernando Romache. I'm a student of the Erasmus Mundus Masters in South European Studies. And um, my question is. Um, how to improve ethnic minority and migrant access to higher education in the European Union? Thank you. So, Ms. Mogherini, you can continue actually uh, for yes, what you were sorry, saying. Sorry, I, I think Thank I missed you. you for one second during your question. So, can you can you please repeat yeah. it? Sorry, uh, this Fernando, sound went could you out repeat? for a second. Yeah. Fernando, could you repeat your question? Yes, sure. Um, how to improve ethnic minority and migrant access to higher education in the European Union? This is an issue on which I have been uh, um, thinking and wondering since I started, which is not too long ago, but still in some months. Uh, because uh, as we 
uh, in particular, I will be very, very open about that, in particular in, in, uh, uh, in an institute like the College of Europe that has the reputation of being extremely elitist and selective, which is true on one side, but uh, uh, it's also more of a reputation than, uh, than a reality because we have many students that come from uh, uh, different backgrounds, especially in social uh, and economic terms, uh, not so much in terms of ethnic diversity. Uh, but uh, um, for the first assessment I have seen, and, and this is uh, something that uh, I think needs reflection, is the power of uh, scholarships uh, to increase the level of diversity of our students. That is, the more scholarships we have, uh, the more it is affordable for all kinds of backgrounds uh, students to come. Uh, and the more diversity we have, and the more we have good output uh, in the educational process. Uh, because I believe really that experiencing and living diversity uh, is, is part, integral part of, the, of the, the process, sometimes even more precious than the courses themselves. Um, but I will not tell the professors this. Uh, so um, I see that. While we are uh, working, uh, and I think we're doing quite well on, on increasing the level of diversity uh, in all different aspects, uh, the, um, the ethnic background uh, is still an issue. And my impression is that this is, and, and by the way, if you look at the European institutions, you realize how much of an issue it is. Um, we have an issue there in Europe. I believe that this is, uh, the result of a lack of policies that have helped uh, bringing up uh, an ethnically diverse student body across Europe consistently over years. These processes need time because you start with, with school and then with high school and then with universities and higher education. You need to, to, to grow a diverse student body in the different layers of the, of the educational system. And I don't think this has been done properly in, in the European uh, education systems. I'm, I'm very open on that. Uh, I think actually, uh, I guess, I don't know the UK system well enough, but I guess the UK system is the one that is doing it well or better than others uh, in, in the European Union today. Um, but that is also a result of a different tradition of academia in, in the UK and also a different composition of the, of the population. Uh, I think that we might need there uh, some incentives and some policies on the European level to tackle specifically this point. Um, because, uh, um, yeah, uh, we, we have in the college, for instance, we have a diverse, uh, very diverse ethnic background, but this is because we have students from all over the world. But if you look at European students, um, the ethnical background diversity is more. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think we need to address this issue, uh, not only institution by institution, but also with general policies that aim at addressing this issue. Also, because again, I think that there is a little bit of a denial uh, mode also in the European institutions on the lack of diversity in the institutions themselves when it comes to ethnic development. Jonathan, and I think this affects negatively the policy making. Yeah, agree. Okay. Jonathan, could you highlight us a little bit on what the situation is at VUB? Um, well, I think when it comes to the student population, the VUB has one of the most diverse uh, populations, uh, certainly in, in, in our country. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a wealth. Um, I must say that when we have discussions about international politics, whether it concerns the Gulf, whether it concerns China, that it's exactly this diversity that often leads to very, very uh, animated and, and sharp discussions. And discussions often, as uh, Ms. Mogherini also uh, indicated, that we as, uh, as teachers can also um, uh, learn, learn from. Um, it's it's, it's a, a, a source of wealth, I would say, but uh, of course, inevitably, it's, it's also a challenge. Um, because um, and, and, and we don't have to beat about the bush about that. And in, in terms of inclusion, um, it's not always evident. You, you, you get to um, students um, with backgrounds that um, often do not come with the preparation uh, that, that, that you have uh, with, um, with other students. Um, and often my um, feeling at least is that they get lost a bit uh, in, uh, in these large um, uh, classrooms again. And I think it's, it's a bit different in the College of, of Europe where, the, where the, the numbers, I guess, are a bit, bit smaller than in the vast majority of universities uh, in, uh, in, in Europe. 
but inclusion means in essence that we with, that we're supposed to do something with diversity it's not enough just to say hey look at how many uh, um, uh, uh, different groups we have um, in uh, on our campus no i think it comes with a very very important responsibility also to cultivate and 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 to 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 benefit from from that diversity and that those with um, a specific um, uh, background that is not so evident that you remedy them, that you give them some additional opportunities in, in the first uh, year or so. And that those with an extra difficult um, background, let's say refugee uh, students, that you even have, have a follow-up after their, um, uh, their graduation. So I don't think um, that diversity is enough. It's what we do with diversity that I think really determines the quality and the added value of our universities, that we should have diversity in the academic staff. I think is also um, uh, important. Uh, of course, that population doesn't uh, change so so rapidly, but I think that the VUB and, and many other universities are making slow progress uh, towards diversifying their uh, their academic uh, their academic staff. Thanks, thanks for the Jonathan, and thanks Fernando for these questions. I will now move on to the next one, which is a question by Ricardo. Hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Ricardo and I'm a student of international politics. I'm, uh, I'm part from the Utopia Alliance and I'm currently studying my master in Belgium. I want to pick up on some, on some points that uh, Rector Mogrini mentioned at the beginning of your opening speech. You talk about uh, digital education and you talk about motivation for students. And then Professor Holzlack, you mentioned about the importance of recollecting um, inf uh, information and exploring more than just experts. So in this new digitalized era of education created due to COVID, is education in the, di in the digital age more vulnerable to fake news? And does this pose a threat to security and to the future of Europe? Thank you. So Jonathan, you have to go first. Um, yeah, no, obviously, I think that um, the um, broadening of, uh, of, of, of media channels, um, uh, of course, also comes with um, a growing uh, or a broadening proliferation of uh, fake news, misinformation, um, and, um, and, so, and so forth. Um, how do we um, prepare uh, young people for, uh, for that? Uh, I think obviously some of the key skills of dealing with information, critically che checking uh, uh, and verifying um, different different sources is um, is important. Um, and 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 I think that education um, is 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 probably um, much more effective and much more important as a as a kind of a firewall against uh, misinformation, certainly that comes from from outside. That a lot of the um, policy initiatives that we are uh, we are setting up to try to uh, check uh, social media uh, and uh, and so on, uh, but that's that's I think a skill that that has to start to be developed at very very early stage. You can even say it primary uh, primary education, um, and 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 that has to come to a fruition. You can say um, at uh, at higher education um, that, but that there is responsibility for um, uh, universities. I think is uh, is evident. Mrs. Mogherini? Yes, not much I can uh, add to that. Perfectly agree. Um, I, I would probably comment on the uh, on the second part of the question: whether this represents a specific challenge and, in particular, a security challenge. Um, I, I think of all different institutions and, and bodies, probably higher education institutions and universities are the ones that are less exposed to the security uh, threats uh, that relate to, uh, to um, misinformation, this um, fake news. And uh, I, I think our public life in terms of uh, the democratic functioning of our systems is much more exposed to that. And I think that also on hard security, we have uh, uh, real challenges where we look at cyber attacks or hybrid threats. This is uh, currently the top priority both of NATO and the European Union when it comes to security challenges together with climate change, which I think is a very wise approach just, just to understand how the security threats move uh, and evolve over time. Uh, and I would probably today also include uh, uh, um, uh, 
supplies in, in the health system as a, a mean to guarantee security and safety of your own population. So indeed, if you, if you looked at hard security issues five years ago and today, you had a completely different picture uh, where uh, the, the, non, the non purely military aspects are much more relevant than the purely military ones. Uh, but I, I would say that the that academia is probably the, 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 the field of, uh, of society that for its own nature is less exposed to, to, to having this uh, challenge transformed into a, a, a risk or a threat, exactly because we develop critical uh, attitudes, which is the only weapon you have to dismantle that threat. So if there is one sector of society that should be safer than others, uh, is academia and higher education in principle. Um, and, and this is also the value of us. Maybe I'm, I should provoke you a little bit and, and ask you what you think or what Jonathan thinks of the Budapest discussion about the Chinese university being established there, alternatively the Central European University being moved from Budapest to Vienna, um, what your reflections are on those, those developments as they certainly from a Collège d'Europe in Natalin perspective also. I would love to hear your views on this. No, I, I would not. Uh, in, I have to, to say the College of Europe in Natalin is functioning perfectly well and uh, is facing no problems at all in this respect. Uh, and uh, um, I have to say that actually it has a, a very, by the way, it has a, it, it's led uh, locally and, and on the ground uh, by an extremely um, sensitive, experienced, wise, intelligent and uh, um, and profoundly uh, European uh, vice rector, and that has all my esteem and with whom I work very well. And I, I would say that the College of Europe in Latin is clearly an island of uh, European studies that is uh, and remains true to the core mission of the College of Europe, which is, I would like to remind it clearly, contributing to the European integration. And that was stated even before the European institutions yes. started. So mm -hmm. um, that stays. Um, on, on Budapest, I would uh, I would follow my my previous habit when I was in the institutions, and I would not comment on that. Very good. Okay, and I can't get any reaction from Jonathan either. I can see that he's reflecting on it. So maybe we'll come back to this later. Anyway, the last question I had here is from Tadja, please. Um, so hello everybody, my name is Taida Kobler and I study communication studies at the University of Ljubljana. Um, I'm also participating in the Biotopian Student Conference where we will discuss the impacts of COVID-19 on international education. So my question is related to this topic. So how can universities prepare students for the ever-changing labor market in the times of online learning uh, when we face with the lack of face-to-face -face practical courses. Thank you. So, as this is my last question, Federica. Yeah, this is uh, the question I think we all have been asking ourselves in the last uh, year. Uh, how do you guarantee the quality of, uh, uh, of uh, the higher education uh, in uh, a purely digital or a, in an hybrid uh, setup with uh, an, edu an higher education system that was largely uh, previously uh, based on non-digital approaches, uh, because uh, it's not the same kind of interaction. Uh, it's not that you simply transfer online the same lesson. It's a completely different approach. And, uh, um, and this is true for the courses. This is true for the exams, uh, how you verify uh, uh, that uh, knowledge is really transferred, that, is, uh, that there's, no, um, there's no cheating. Um, and I think that this can actually be an opportunity for us to, uh, to, to develop um, more, I would say, more mature approaches uh, to teaching and learning. Um, and moving from a transfer, a pure transfer of knowledge, which should, should never be the only issue, but has sometimes been a core issue, to uh, the development of, uh, uh, of thinking. Um, and, and skills. Um, skills are not less relevant than thinking, but uh, skills without thinking, you don't do much for that. Um, that is the, the difference. Well, thinking without skills, you, you still have an interior life uh, you can be satisfied with. But uh, 
I think that this can help us develop a, a, a new way of, uh, of preparing our curricula, the content of our courses, preparing also not only the students, but also uh, the faculty on uh, digital skills, which has been a challenge this year. I think in, in our case, the academic assistants have been the backbone of our, of our um, online uh, teaching, because in many cases, uh, out of the 210 professors we have, some of them were not particularly familiar with all the digital instruments we had. Uh, and here comes back the issue I was referring to before, the importance of having a diversification of generations also in, in the faculty. Uh, because sometimes you have skills, uh, uh, some sorts of skills uh, in, in the more, most experienced professors and some other times you have a different kind of approach and dynamism uh, of uh, professors that are uh, of different generations. But I think there is an additional element to that. Well, first of all, I think there's no going back from where we are. Uh, my, my feeling is that uh, the back to normal is, is not on the menu. I don't think the normal is, is hopefully not this, but also not the one we lived two years ago. I don't think that we will ever go back there. Uh, I think that some elements of what we're living will stay with us, hopefully in, in lighter forms, but we stay with us long. The way in which we are preparing is to be ready to, to, to consider hybrid uh, either the norm or the possibility on very short notice, because you might have the need to switch to hybrid or fully online with very short notice. So the flexibility element, which is not speciality of academia, uh, is, uh, is predominant in this moment. Um, and I think that there is one particular uh, element that is, uh, is important. I was mentioning this in the very beginning uh, of our conversation. I think that we, have, we are not, uh, we're not focusing enough and, and we're not appreciating enough the learning by doing that our students are having in this year. I think that the experience of following courses, uh, doing interviews for the thesis, uh, doing exams online, might end up being one of the most relevant parts of your CV tomorrow, because nobody has been trained to do that as you have been during this year. So turning, turning a, a, a lack of opportunity, you miss the personal contact with the professor into an asset uh, is, is something that, that is, is useful because I, all my former colleagues and friends that are working in the institutions, are telling me we had to adapt from a day that was full of meetings to uh, weeks and, and months that were meetings and travels, weeks and months uh, of agendas that were uh, Zoom, WebEx um, teams, uh, Zoom, WebEx teams. Uh, so uh, you will be trained to that. You will have had the experience of passing exams and, and following courses and interacting and doing presentations online, uh, maybe with professor in, in connected uh, online and you present in the room, if you have the, uh, the, the, the chance of having a, an hybrid uh, setup, or you, you can turn this into an opportunity. And I think that we will need to structure this over time, over the next years, uh, also changing the methodology of teaching, because you cannot teach the same lesson uh, in presence or online. Uh, attention goes, uh, goes away after three minutes. And I, I experienced this myself actually last year, and then I stopped. Uh, I was actually a visiting professor in Bruges last year uh, in the second semester. So I started in January, plenty of enthusiasm, my 21 students, uh, happy to meet them for three hours of exchanges. And then after three or four lessons, uh, uh, we had to turn online fully. And I, yeah, I, I had to change completely the approach we had, interaction was more difficult, and even an element of psychological interaction was needed uh, because uh, we're human beings and, uh, uh, and, and we are a community. And I think this element of being together in a difficult time is also part of, of the college, well, of the academic experience somehow, not only at the college everywhere. So I think that we will need to have uh, professors turning a little bit uh, also into um, advisors and friends, if not psychologists. Uh, and by the way, I don't know how it has worked in, in, uh, in other universities, uh, but we have had to more than double the psychological support for students. And, uh, and if we continue like that, probably with staff as well. Uh, so it's a completely different world, but I think that the digital asset that you have after experiencing these challenging times 
uh, will be one of the skills that uh, will be most useful for, for your future job opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Yeah, to be brief, I just would like to repeat um, that we all have to try to turn this challenge into an opportunity. That's the only way of dealing with any, any crisis, I, um, I assume. We should not underestimate the possibilities. Uh, I think professors are still grading your papers, uh, your exams, um, that even digitally we can have interactive moments. That's at least my, my experience that, uh, however stubborn and, and, and perhaps um, uh, unflexible these um, digital channels like the canvas platform and so forth are students willing can still engage they can push that microphone button and the camera button and and and, and step in make their comments and they do it took some time uh, but usually it also takes some time in the classroom some some months to uh, to acclimatize to uh, to overcome some of the initial initial fears, so we should not underestimate um, the, the 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 possibilities. And and I think after after a transition time, uh, most of us have uh, have got to um, to live with it. With of course that side note that um, and and we cannot stress that enough. There are students struggling with slow internet connections, with poor uh, computers, um, and so forth. And those students, I think we must have we must help. Uh, in every uh, in every possible way. Uh, also, we should not overestimate um, um, the problems. Uh, just overall, uh, I would say, or the specificity of the the problems. Um, interaction usually, at least my experience uh, in classrooms, is limited to a minority, um, and also, I think one of the main reasons why this personal touch that Mrs. Mogherini. Um, referred to is not so easy and why it's not evident for lecturers to be um, be a bit um, uh, more empathic and, and personal with students is, is also that there are so many if I if I talk for myself it's 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 examining uh, close to what will it be 700 students every year um, and 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 of course if you get this kind of uh, um, um, scaling up of, uh, of teaching, I think it's going beyond the COVID problem. Um, I think the core problem is, is not Corona, but the core problem is that, and perhaps the College of Europe is still the exception, the, 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 the rule um, uh, is at European universities that their size makes it just um, uh, slightly challenging, uh, more challenging to, to, to have this human touch in, uh, in education and to, to have this um, due attention paid to uh, to individual talents and and and, and strengths and, and 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 weaknesses and I, I i would say that this is uh, perhaps much more important in in the debate than the short-term fallout of um, of of COVID. i'm not defeatist i think we will get through it and and, and knowing students and, and and most of my colleagues uh, i think we will clench our fist and, and continue to battle through that um, but but I think looking beyond COVID is uh, is, is 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 very um, is very important, um, and continuing to preserve the energy and also to see how important it is to uh, to inspire and to coach um, uh, young talents uh, to to help contribute to European citizenship and and leadership is what I think will keep most of us uh, going. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, and in particular, Mrs. Mogherin and Jonathan Holslag, many, many thanks for this uh, readiness to go into answering in such detail all these questions which were fired to you. And there were lots of um, Q&A questions also being raised, um, going further in some of the direction. Let me just make a couple of brief uh, comments at the end of this, this long session. I think, and, and I, I I cannot repeat in any way the, the very nice ways in which both Jonathan has put his five cardinal balances as well as the, the way Mrs. Mogherini responded and, and focused very much on some of these issues about democracy and values and European values. But let me just start from the higher education part by trying to explain on from what we've heard why Europe is moving very cautiously in this area and why this European Universities Network Initiative, as we are witnessing here with this Utopia Initiative, is something which is a stepwise progress in terms of trying to create a network between some universities who have common 
interest, who are ready, as put also in some of the Q&A questions, to pull together centers of excellence, in some cases as in Ethiopia, in other cases, joint degrees, as in some of the other networks which have been funded in a very stepwise, very cautious way. And I think uh, Ms. Mogherini put clearly the way why this is happening in this way, because you know you have to be careful not to move into the idea, which I mean, I must admit myself when I was still in, in at a young age, had this idea of a European education area, which would really be common to everybody. And even as far I, I got known in Flanders very much as the one who pushed the whole Dutch education into English, uh, for instance, by saying that we did Maastricht, uh, Maastricht University being a border university, you were of course providing all teaching in English. Uh, and the rule was English unless. So the couple of courses, uh, Dutch law, dealing with patients had to be in Dutch, but all the rest we moved into English. So this harmonization and standardization, I think has been rightly put here both by Jonathan and, and Mrs. Mogherini as something where one has to be careful and cherish the diversity which we have intrinsically in Europe and which are encapsulated, so to say, in these European democratic values. And I think that from that perspective, it explains why the integration, the inclusion of the differences we have in Europe in the higher education models uh, is limited. And to what extent we have indeed primarily mobility schemes such as Erasmus, where we have also common research agreed basis, et cetera. And we then move on to the, the further exchange. And you know, Europe has been still one of the unique regions in the world, which has this incredible exchange of students between different European countries and at the level of research, the mobility of grants, etc. I don't think there are any other regions in the world which have the same kind of framework with respect to uh, enhancing, trying to enhance mobility and creating this kind of European values to these European networks. So I think this is really the point really about why higher education plays the central role in the future of Europe, I think was has been well made and, and well argued here uh, this evening in, in these debates. Second point is of course that there is the much more stubborn diversity, uh, much more difficult diversity, uh, which I think Mrs. Mogherini in particular highlighted very much from within the European institutions itself, which is a diversity in age, diversity in ethnic, uh, belonging and diversity in gender terms also, I would add. And which is still something where we are, one is working on and which is a long time effort. And where you can see that the differences in the situations in which the universities are located is a very central issue. I mean, the situation of a capital a university in the capital city in Brussels is very different from a university in a provincial, very nice town such as Bruges or at the same way in a city like Maastricht. The differences are massive in terms of the way the ethnic diversity in the population, the ethnic diversity in the students, et cetera, is reflected immediately. And hence the challenges are very differently. And I think this is why this collaboration or this utopia network and the, the integration between universities in very different settings is so extraordinarily interesting within this European setting and also this collaboration here between VUB and Collège d'Europe is a very interesting one between, you could say, the center, the capital of Europe with all the institutions there, but with the diversity also in an ethnic sense and migration and all the other challenges of inclusion and a small provincial think tank town, so to say, uh, Bruges in which you could reflect, dream as Jonathan put it, and develop the skills to know. So in this sense, I think this combination of Bruges and Brussels is again, a fascinating one. The, my third point would be to, that is that with respect to the challenges of, ahead of us, and of course we all are within the, the, the COVID uh, challenge uh, today, dramatically impacted. And I think on their boat, I think it's, it's fascinating to listen to both Mrs. Mogherini and Jonathan Holzlack to see how they use the changes which are occurring indeed as an opportunity, as an illustration of things are not going to go back to normal. And we are really going into a situation in which there are new opportunities evolving out of this COVID-19 crisis. And I think on this, uh, well, 
it's really the lack of knowledge yet on how digital hybrid forms of education evolve and to what extent are they successful? What are the digital didactics? Didactics we know in terms of particular courses being given in a digital framework, where can we indeed, where do we need interaction? The example given by Mrs. Mogherini in terms of her experiences at the Collège d'Europe last year when she had to teach, et cetera, are very illustrative in there. There are different forms of education flipping classroom, all kinds of other forms, which we can really experiment with today in this COVID-19 framework and which have been imposed. And hence we have now to distill those which are basically adding much more value to the higher education system than they've just been imposed. And that is the value which we have to extract. I, I think this is a fascinating area of further development. And we will, in the higher education system, it will, in my view, have major implications in terms of changing the organizational setup of higher education in Europe. I really believe that here uh, we will enter new forms of networking, networking in which we, uh, it's no longer the old MOOCs frameworks we use, but are different sort of frameworks in which the possibly the European university networks could play a major role. And I refer a number to a number of the questions uh, and answers which were raised here by several people belonging to that network. Let me conclude by, first of all, thank of course our two guest speakers here, uh, Mrs. Mogherini, Rector of the Collège d'Europe, and of course, Jonathan Holslag at the VUB. Let me also thank Luc van Langenhoven from the Utopia Network, and of course, the, the real workers, uh, Lisa de Potter, Jessica Callebaut, having organized all this. Many thanks, well done. Normally, you know, in the physical world, I would now hand over something, um, some flowers, some drinks, some other things, etc. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to do this here. I cannot do this. So the only thing I can say is thank you so much and well done. What a great session. And again, thank you so much for having been here with us. And I hope to see you wherever, Bruges, Brussels, wherever, Jonathan, you are for the moment, uh, somewhere in the not too distant future. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. All right, thank, thank you all. You. Thank